live Q&A session and we are also going to cover how to teach kids to answer WH questions, kids with autism specifically. Um, so we are going to get started in about five minutes at one o'clock Eastern time. So I'm going to set the timer. So if you are here, if you want to tell me if you are a parent or professional, and if, uh, you have any autism questions, I will uh, go through some of them. So I'll talk to you soon. In about five minutes, we'll get started.
Hi there, it's Dr. Mary Barbera here for a live Q&A session all about autism. I am also going to be covering a short segment on how to teach kids to answer WH questions and how you can use a, um, an assessment to measure how high functioning the language of your child or client is. So if you are here and you can hear me, if you can um, let me know in the comments, that would be great. Um, I see we have uh, several parents here and professionals. We have an SLP who's also the mom of a two-year-old with autism. Um, so just leave me a comment. And if you have an autism question, I will try to get to it. I will answer a couple questions before I do my little presentation on introverbals, which are the answer part of uh, conversation, the answering of WH questions. We have a parent from Kenya. My son is six years old and autistic, and um, he's very calm. He's he's too calm and she'd like to know how to get him more active. Uh, two year old son with ASD. I want him to respond when he hears his name. Um, and I did do a video blog on that response to the name. So, um, let me go over that question. How do you get a child to respond to his or her name? which is one of the warning signs of, of um, autism, actually. If you have a baby or a toddler um, who is not responsive to their name always, um, that is a warning sign that um, it might be autism. So uh, how to teach this skill, and I talk about this, like I said, in, in a video blog, and so you could always search Mary Autism Response to Name to actually watch that video blog when we're done here, but let me briefly explain how I would recommend proceeding. First of all, we need to reduce the use of the child's name. So we don't want to be saying, I remember when the first, um, consultant came to my house, um, and to work with Lucas and to show us what to do. She, she basically said, you know, everybody's using Lucas's name way too much. So we'd be like, Lucas, Lucas, come here. Lucas, touch your nose. Lucas, stop that Lucas. And she said, basically, he's the only one in the room you using his name, especially when you're saying no, or you're giving a demand is actually not helping. So we want to reduce the use of the child's name, uh, which seems kind of counterintuitive. And then we want to use the child's name only when we have a strong reinforcement. So if we're blowing bubbles, we might say bubbles, bubbles. And then we might say, Johnny, Johnny bubbles, or we're pushing them on the swing push. Oh, Johnny, we're going fast. One, two, three, Johnny. Um, so we want to do a lot of that when we, when the child is happy, when they're having a good time, we don't want to pair the word name with stop or no. And then we can actually run kind of trials of child's attending to something else. We come close to him. Uh, we have something he wants, maybe a small little treat or a drink or bubbles or something he wants. We say Johnny and we present the bubbles and then we get a little bit farther with less of a physical touch um, to repair his name that when he hears his name, actually good things start to happen. And this is a technique that I developed over the years and it is quite successful in many situations. Um, okay. My son is, okay. So, um, this person addressed me as Barbara, but I'm actually Mary Barbera. And for those of you that don't know me, I fell into the autism world back in the late 1990s when my firstborn son, Lucas, was diagnosed with autism. Actually, when he started to show signs um, is when I actually fell into the world. But I didn't know that until the day before he was three when he was diagnosed with moderate to severe autism. I also have a typically developing son, Spencer, who's 22. They're 22 and 23 years of age. I went on to become a board certified behavior analyst, wrote a book in uh, the verbal behavior approach. It was published in 2007. 
It's available in over a dozen languages. And I am writing my second book, which will be out in April of 2021. And that book will be really focused to help parents of very young kids with autism or signs of autism, which is speech delays, sensory processing issues, maybe some early signs. You don't know if it's autism or ADHD or some other issue. Um, cause what I found over the years as a board certified behavior analyst is that it's the same treatment. So, um, uh, this question is my son is six. He always answered WH questions with different answers. He also likes repeating the same questions a lot during the day. Can you help? Okay. And we are going to talk about answering WH questions, which is our topic for the day. Um, my four-year-old son loves structure and visual calendars, but lately he's becoming obsessed with taking pecs out. How can we handle this? Um, yeah. So, you know, especially with the world as it is now with COVID shut down, many parts of the area, including where I live in Pennsylvania are still mostly shut down. Um, so kids can definitely get more obsessed with things and they're out of their routine, making it very, very difficult for parents to manage these obsessive um, interests and kind of bad habits because there's a lot of time in the day. Um, so the short answer for any question on how to reduce problem behaviors is you want to spend 95% of your time preventing problem behaviors. And um, that's easier said than done. And it's not something that I can easily tell you what to do in, uh, answer to a Q and a, uh, session. But if you would like to learn more about my approach, which includes how to increase language and decrease problem behavior and teach kids things like eating better, sleeping, weaning from pacifiers and bottles, um, all kinds of things like that, keeping kids safe, making them happy, um, getting them out of ritualistic behaviors, uh, making their uh, lives more independent and happy, then you can attend a free online workshop where I go into some of the mistakes that parents and professionals make. And whether you're a parent or professional or both in some many situations, um, you can find one of my, uh, workshops that will address your concerns. And in the workshop, you'll also learn about joining me for my online course and community. Um, I produce a lot of free content. I produce a video blog every week and I produce a podcast every week. I have also been doing, uh, Facebook lives, um, every week, which actually right now, this is going to be my last Facebook live on Mondays at one for a while because, um, I really need to serve people in a more step-by-step -step fashion, which is part of my online courses and community. And we're seeing complete transformations in many situations. Um, and I, I really do want to serve people in more of a step-by-step -step capacity. So I will continue doing my free blogs and my free, um, podcasts. And you can, you know, catch me on a live here and there, but, um, that's kind of a decision we made recently. So if you would like to learn more about my system, because it's not just reducing this behavior or increasing this, be this language or getting sleep better. It's, it's very complicated with a, in each child to help them make their best improvements. Um, so some of the moms in, in the toddler course are reporting that during the shutdown during COVID, they've actually expanded their child's language. In a couple of situations, they've posted that their child started at zero words and is now talking or started at two words and now is saying 500 words. And this is within 60 days, um, which is awesome. Um, really awesome. But the course is a lot of work and what I find with anything, um, whether you're learning to play the piano or you're losing weight or you're, um, taking up a new hobby like painting, um, it takes time to, to develop expertise and to develop, um, skills and gather the right information in the right order. So one of the reasons that we decided not to continue on so much with every week doing these Facebook lives is 
is, you know, me answering a little question here or there is not getting you where you need to be very as quickly as possible. And that is certainly the goal. Um, my goal for each child is for the, each child, whether they have autism or not, both my boys, Lucas and Spencer, I want both of them to be as safe as possible, as independent as possible, and as happy as possible. And to get the language as high as possible, to get problem behaviors as low as possible, um, to have family be as happy as possible, because we all have one life. And whether if autism is in our life, if you're a parent out there, I, I feel for you. I have a son who is uh, has autism. He also has uh, intellectual disability and he requires uh, lifelong care. Um, for some kids though that I've worked with and for some I'm uh, anticipating for my online course members, for some of them, especially for those that join when their kids are really little. Um, you know, some of my former clients are now in college and going to college and learning to drive. And so we all know that the autism spectrum is very wide. But what I know for sure is that we can, especially early on, and that's why my new book is going to be focused on early uh, signs of autism. We can't afford to wait in line. We can't afford to try every free thing under the sun. We can't afford to be going in a zillion direction. Our child's life really depends on it. Um, so I am on a mission to turn autism around for millions of kids um, and help each child reach their fullest potential. Tomorrow's podcast um, is an interview with Mandy, whose son is very high functioning now. He started off not so high functioning. I worked with him eight years ago and out of the blue, she contacted me and, and agreed to be on my podcast to share her story. He's fully conversational. He knows his mom went on my podcast. He's going to listen to it. He is in middle school. He's getting straight A's. He's on the football team. And those sorts of things can happen. And no one has a crystal ball. But the earlier we address, we, the earlier we teach parents what to do, the better the outcome, always. Okay, so let me see if there are any other burning questions. Um, okay. So Emily said, uh, her son is 11 and has trouble with conditional discrimination issues of who, what, where, which, um, in isolation. So he, if, so he can't fluently say, you know, um, answer, uh, which animal lives on a farm? Um, what, what are you doing? Where are we going? He can't ask, answer those kind of questions only if it's presented very much like one question at a time. Um, so he has trouble flexibly merging all of those things. So we can talk about that a little bit in the intraverbal uh, portion of the discussion. Uh, Danielle's here. Good to see you. Um, Snitta said, I'm Snita. Um, I'm a part of your program and learning step-by-step step slowly. It's super and very helpful. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much. She says lots of gratitude and I'm grateful, especially for the people who are in my online course and community who are, you know, it takes work. Like she said, she's making progress slowly, um, and, and, but surely, and it takes work, but I do, uh, know that, I can lead you in the right direction. Stacy said, how can I help my 2.5 year old newly diagnosed with autism? The very best thing I can say to you, Stacy, is to, after this is done, sign up for my free workshop, marybarbera.com forward slash workshop, watch the workshop and consider joining my online course and community. It is the very best thing that I know how to help. Um, my son is just 2.8, nonverbal, not understanding commands, don't know how to start again, um, especially the toddler preschooler course. It is just, I'm seeing such fabulous results. Uh, many of the families there are, their child's not even diagnosed yet. Their uh, services have been completely shut off or not started because of COVID. Um, even families that their child does go to ABA programming, they are learning a ton too, because we don't just cover what to do at a table. We cover what to do during bedtime, bath time, 
feeding time, how to wean from bottles and pacifiers and things like that. And um, getting the child to be happy to want to learn from you um, is the key. Okay. Um, and uh, Burmet said she is in my course and she's wondering about continuing access. And yes, we do have a membership program. So most of our members do end up staying with us long term. Some members uh, have been with me for years, like five years. Uh, we do have some members that have been with me for five years because this is not a, a sprint. It's a marathon. And I often say it's a marathon on a roller coaster. Uh, I can get quite, quite uh, challenging. Okay. So I am going to come back and get questions in a second. Um, well, not in a second, in a few minutes, <laughs> because I did prepare a, uh, short lecture on, um, on answering WH questions. And so I want to present that for about 20 minutes or so, hope, maybe, maybe less. Um, and then I'll come back and take your questions. And if you have questions about what I'm presenting or other questions, that's, that will work as well. So we are going to talk about teaching a child to answer questions. And we think about conversational skills. Uh, if you say, is Lucas conversational? He's actually not conversational and he's 23 years old. Um, but you know, typically developing, of course, my typically developing son was conversational at three or four years of age. And that's usually when, um, kids become conversational at three, four years of age. And but kids with autism often, some of them do become conversational and some of them don't. But what I've learned over the past two decades, and especially since 2003, when I became a board certified behavior analyst is we don't just have to like cross our fingers and hope that our child is conversational. There are actually building blocks we can teach to help a child get conversational. So if we think about a conversation, say I run into you, um, at the grocery store and I haven't seen you for a while. And I say, Hey Susie, um, how have you been? Um, I heard your son graduated from high school. Um, what's it, what's he doing? Um, I am asking questions. I have, uh, I I'm asking questions and Susie, assuming she has time, she understands English, she's conversational. Um, she, she answers, um, yeah, he just graduated. He's going to temple for this or that. Oh, and if she has some more time, um, and she likes me and she's, she's not with somebody, she might ask me a question. Well, how have you been doing in the past two months since I've seen you? Um, and then I would answer back. So that, uh, conversation is made up mostly of what we call advanced mans or requests for information and advanced intraverbals. So you might be like intraverbals. I don't understand what you're talking about. Where'd you come up with that word? So back in 1957, BF Skinner wrote a book called verbal behavior not about autism. It's about, um, language and the fact that language is a behavior and it can be taught. And so there's a lot in BF Skinner's verbal behavior book about, um, learning a second language. Um, and up until the point of 1957, and even still now today, many people think that uh, language is just a cognitive thing that happens kind of magically. They don't, uh, they don't really believe that language can be broken down and taught as systematically as I know it can. And as BF Skinner knew it could. Um, so in the book, verbal behavior, uh, BF Skinner talks about four 
verbal operants, four elementary verbal operants or main verbal operants. So if you said my child has 10 words, I would want to know how he uses those words. Does he ask for cookie? Does he go around and say car? Does he just label uh, Dora the Explorer characters? Whatever he says. Does he answer questions or sing little songs? So we have four operants, the mand, which is a request that starts off with just a request for um, water, cookie, um, just a basic request. And that doesn't have to be vocal, verbal language. That could be a sign. It could even be a gesture. And it can also be crying, like newborn babies manned to be fed, manned to have their diaper changed by crying. So problem behaviors are almost always related to the inability to manned uh, verbally or through signs or through pictures or through a device. So the mand is totally important for so many reasons. And it needs to be the centerpiece of a child's program, a child with speech delays or with autism. Okay, the second verbal operant that B.F. Skinner talked about and coined the term is tact, T-A-C-T. Tact, you can remember by coming in contact with one of your senses. So most of the time when we talk about tacts, we talk about things you see. So in my environment, I might see the light in front of me or my phone or a pen and I label it. Um, so a tact is important, but a lot of times tacts are due to sudden changes. And it doesn't have to just be a visual tact. It could be a smell, like I smell something burning. So that would be a tact, that'd be an important tact. Um, if I yelled, I smell something burning to another person, that would be a tact, but it would also be a mand for, in, for attention. So a lot of times the mand and the tact are combined. Um, so oftentimes if I see water and I'm thirsty, I might say water if somebody else is in the room and I get water. Now, if I just see water and I take it and I sip it, that's not really a verbal operant. That's a, a private event that I'm just managing myself. But when we're talking about really little kids or even babies where they're, uh, an adult's required to give them a lot of, of things, um, that's when we really have to separate it out. Or if I were learning a foreign language, I'd have to learn the name for water, both as a man, as a tact, and oftentimes we combine those because it's a lot easier to learn language when we have a visual. So man's and tacts, super important. Echoics are certainly important as well. I've done video blogs and a whole podcast on echoic control. Um, the ability for me to say, this is water, or if I were speaking another language, this is ubi, ubi, ubi. I'd be like, okay, I have to know that because I'm going to need water. So uh, let me remember that's ubi. So man, tact, echoic. And the fourth one that we're going to talk about today is the intraverbal. So the intraverbal, again, coined by Dr. Uh, B.F. Skinner, and he, it is the answer part of a WH question. It's basically like I say something and you say something in response. And unlike in a COIC where we have quote unquote point to point correspondence, I say water, you say water, that's in a COIC. I say water, now you say drink. Or I say water and you say I like uh, spring water. I like water that's cold or whatever. Um, we are still having me say something, you say something, but they don't match like the echoic matches. So introverbals are always the hardest operant. So we're going to have man's tax and echoics first. Introverbals come in later in typically developing children or in uh, a, a foreign language acquisition. 
So that, but that intraverbal is super important because most of what we learn in life, most of going to school and listening and learning, um, are interverbals. And so they're super important. They usually come in for typically developing kids, according to Dr. Mark Sundberg, who wrote the VB map assessment, um, usually start to come in around 18 months of age. Um, so that early, early stuff, um, with interverbals, I'm going to tell you a little story about Lucas before I knew he had autism, before I knew anything about ABA. I mean, he was two years old, not even, um, my husband was starting to get concerned. He brought it up to me. I told him, I don't want to hear it. He doesn't have autism and went into a deep state of denial. Right. But what, he, what my husband did do is he started playing around. Neither of us knew anything about how to teach kids to talk. Um, so he, he goes, Hey, watch this. And there used to be an, um, a cartoon named Arthur, like a little kid show. And it had a theme song. And so my husband goes, Hey, watch this. And he said, so Charlie said, and I said, and Lucas said, Hey, Charlie said, what a wonderful kind of Lucas said day. Charlie said, you can learn to work. And Lucas said, play and get along with each other. So he was doing fill in the blanks to the last word of songs which was an introverbal fill-in, which is the most baby kind of fill-ins, the most baby kind of introverbals. But I had no idea what that was. I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, and you can do the same thing with twinkle, twinkle, little. How I wonder what you, you can do the same thing with prayers. Our Father who art in, hallowed be thy. You can do the same thing with, um, nursery rhymes. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat in the fiddle, you know, one, two, buckle my shoe. Um, and so in a lot of ways, um, because of my experience with Lucas early on, when I didn't even know what an introverbal was, a lot of times with completely non-vocal kids, kids that are not talking at all, I will try to go in the back door with songs and song fill-ins and pairing songs and leaving that last word blank. Um, so that's the early introverbals. I'll give you another story with a kid who, because I'm going to talk about this introverbal subtest that Dr. Mark Sundberg created, but I first want to show you how important it is, whether your child's talking, not talking, um, or your clients, how to quickly assess how high functioning they are, how their language is. Do you need a VB map assessment? Is this child too high for a VB map assessment? And this is the way I have found over the past 20 plus years how to assess very quickly. Another story, I was a behavior analyst in a classroom, in a public school autism classroom, and the teacher said, oh, we got a new student, um, Timmy over there, I forget his name, um, and, uh, yeah, he's really high functioning because we, in our verbal behavior classrooms, we used to have pretty moderate to severe kids, maybe some mild kids, but, um, most of them were not able to be included very much into regular education, uh, without an assistant going with them. A lot of times they were able to go to like general inclusion, general ed for, specials or for recess or lunch, but academics were particularly hard, especially for the little kids that in the elementary school grades with autism. So she said, this child's really high functioning. Great. So I go over to Timmy and I, she told me his name was Timmy, but I, so I go, Hey buddy, what's your name? And I think he said Timmy, but he kind of mumbled it. I wasn't, I was just like, okay. And then I said something else, like maybe what's your favorite color? So I'm trying to see if he can answer WH questions. I forget what he said for that. And then I said, hey, what flies in the sky? Which is a very basic question. And 
he said, I mean, he knew like Sky and stuff, but he goes, three, two, one, blast off. And, you know, for a second grade student, that's not high functioning in my book. That's, you know, he has language, great. He has some associations of flies and rockets, and he could maybe answer what's his name and what's your favorite color. Um, so he had some good skills, but I have found that it is a quick, easy way to determine how high functioning, um, language wise a child is. I had another client, I did an independent evaluation one time, went in, mom got a phone call. So, uh, she was nine. Mom decided to homeschool her because she was afraid she was going to get kicked out of school. Uh, she was overturning desks. She was getting so upset. Um, and I started asking her, Hey, what are some, um, things you wear? Dresses, shorts, pants, capris, socks, shoes, underwear, you know, sounds really great. Uh, what are some animals listed a full, full host of animals? Hey, what, uh, some colors. Okay. She's fine with that. Then I got a little more abstract, which is tell me some things that are usually red. Now it was Christmas time because I remember her staring at the Christmas tree and she said Christmas lights, but I am looking for an intraverbal, which is no visuals. So basically close your eyes and picture something that's red, which would be like a stop sign, a strawberry, those sorts of things. So I go, Oh honey, can you close your eyes? and tell me something that's red. Cause I didn't want her looking around the room and saying, well, there's a red chair and there's a red bird. That's a statue. Um, so I was like, Oh, could you close your eyes and tell me something that's red? And she started screaming at me. Don't tell me to close my eyes. I was like, Oh my gosh. So when it went from relatively easy for her categories that she had learned since preschool, remember she was nine years old to, uh, really hard for her, which was tell me some things that are usually red, which isn't that hard, but she didn't know it. And so she would get very upset when she, when the questions would go from relatively easy that she knew to hard. She also, I think uh, somebody asked a question earlier, she would also get upset if you marked her as having an error. I remember I, the same girl I was assessing later in the day with like, why do you, why do you brush your teeth? And she would say things like, because there's toothpaste. And so obviously she's like that other boy that was quote unquote high functioning. She had, uh, is some association memory and that sort of thing, but that's not why you brush your teeth. So I would write like a negative down or circle the negative so I could kind of keep track of like where she was at. And, um, she got very angry that I was marking her as negative, even though I was trying to do it very discreetly. And she started screaming at me, grabbing the pencil. And so all of these examples, whether we're talking about Lucas very early on filling in the Arthur song to Arthur Fillins, uh, whether we're talking about the, um, boy, the new boy at school who said three, two, one blast off when I asked him what flies in the sky or this girl who was really good at answering some category questions, but then got very confused with others. Um, so yeah, the, these are all introverbal responses. And so Mark Sundberg, Dr. Mark Sundberg, who wrote the forward for my first book, the verbal behavior approach, he also wrote the verbal, the BB map assessment, which is brilliant assessment. Um, my verbal behavior bundle of courses really dives deep into assessing and programming using the BB map assessment. But part of the VB map assessment are the supplements that are not, well, they're not really a part of the VB map assessment, but they are really helpful. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit more about the VB map assessment. Now in the, uh, comments or show notes below here, 
we are going to put in a link that you can go to Mark Sundberg's website, avbpress.com. Under the VBMAP supplementary information, you can download for free this um, intraverbal assessment uh, subtest. And it is really um, quite tricky to assess a child um, in, in the, with who has deficits, but I think this is the best way I know how to assess kids as quickly as possible. Um, and then to learn how to program for, for them. I'm not going to really show that, be able to show that or talk to you about programming specifically, because obviously it involves a lot more of these processes and you want to be careful that you program for intraverbals very carefully otherwise you're going to end up with a kid who scripts who gives rote responses and is not very flexible so the interverbal subtest again you can download it for free it has eight groups of responses so the first group of responses are those fill in the blanks to songs or to easy things like one two blank ready set blank. Pika, boo. Happy birthday to head, shoulders, knees, and, um, and then others, uh, just word fill, fill ins like a dog says, and a kitty says, um, so some song fill ins and some animal sounds. So the other thing I want to say is if you go through these, some, some kids can't really sit and attend as you go through everything, but if they get eight out of 10 right in the group, um, then you can pretty much go to the second group. That could be a different sitting. You don't have to do this sitting at a table. You could do this assessment on a swing. It doesn't require any visuals. In fact, you can't have any visuals. So you can't have a star in on the table when you say twinkle, twinkle, little. You know, you, you can't hold up a star. Um, you can in terms of teaching, that is one of the teaching techniques that I use, but in terms of just an assessment, there's no materials needed. I do sometimes like to use a little clicker. Um, yeah, I have one here. A little clicker counter. Um, you can just Google online clicker counters. I do like to keep um, track of especially positive responses. Um, and then I also have this sheet out where I'm actually writing down their responses. So if it's close, like the girl with the, why do we brush our teeth? And she says tooth because there's toothpaste. I'd want to actually, in addition to writing minus for, for that one and not giving her credit, I would write down the exact response. Um, even typically developing kids might have very different kind of responses. Okay. So group one is those fill in the blanks to songs, uh, and then, uh, some animal sounds group two are things like what's your name, um, shoes and socks. Uh, you ride, uh, now if they, if you say you ride, uh, they're supposed to say bike or scooter. Um, if they wagon maybe, but ride a car, you know, I would probably count cars fine because maybe they have a little play car, but you have to be careful about going well, close enough. Um, because a lot of kids, especially as you get to the harder questions, uh, we'll, we'll have errors, but they'll be kind of close. Um, but you don't want to overcount. Uh, so what's outside, you know, they might say window. Well, you, you wouldn't want them looking outside as you're saying that, but if they're sitting at a room and they can't really see out the window, but you say what's outside and they say window because they're looking towards, you know, that's wrong. Like outside is like trees, grass, you know, those sorts of things could be correct. Um, so as we get to the groups three and four, they start to get harder. Um, where is the refrigerator? Where do you take a bath? And so to teach those, those 
things in group four, we would get pictures of the kitchen, pictures of the bathroom. We would teach them features, but you don't want to teach to the test. You don't want to say, um, so you don't want to just teach a kitty says, and a dog says you want to teach animal sounds both in that direction and the other direction. Uh, moo moo says the cow, what's a cow say, or cow says moo moo. Um, and you have to be super careful because if they don't have mat mans, if they don't have tax, you can end up making a really big mess of teaching introverbals. And then your hardest questions. Now this, this should be for a typically developing 18 month up to four year old, five year old max. Um, so if you have somebody that you're like, I don't know if he has autism, he's five. He seems to talk okay to me. I would take this, this interverbal assessment. I might only do groups three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, maybe start at eight. If they can get all of group eight, they're probably fine in terms of language. I'm not saying they don't have autism, but in terms of language for a five-year-old. But if you have an eight-year-old functioning here, then they might not be fine. If they have some holes in here, that means that they're eight functioning at a four-year-old level of language and there's a big gap then. So group eight are things like what's in a balloon? What do you take to a birthday party? So they might say cake or, um, so you would want them to answer gift, present, not birthday cake, blow out the candles. Those would be wrong. Uh, where do you go if you're sick? Why do you wear a coat? Uh, what do you do before bed? So you can see how these get really tricky. So um, filling this out is a good first step, but my uh, verbal behavior bundle, bonus videos, uh, it just systematically teaches you what to do so you don't end up making mistakes that are going to cause language to be weirder. So um, in, in summary, whether you have a child that isn't even talking or just saying a few words, know that the first introverbal skills are going to be fill in the blanks to songs, fill in the blanks to animal sounds, um, things like that. And then as the child progresses or if you're getting to a child and they're older, but your language is still not conversational, um, the best way I know how to assess that interverbal language is by uh, completing the VB, VB map supplemental material, which is the introverbal subtest created by Dr. Mark Sundberg. So I hope you enjoyed that little tutorial on the introverbal and the importance of doing the introverbal subtest for both parents and professionals. I think it's super accessible and super important. Okay, so now I am going to go back onto my dashboard and see if I have questions from you guys. So um, if anybody has any comments or questions about uh, what I just discussed. Um, okay, so here's a question that sounds related to introverbal. So I kind of think I'll stick to those kind of questions. So if you have a question about what I just covered, that would be great. Okay, so Stephanie says, I'm getting stuck at a level where a child can do song fill-ins and animal so songs. Ugh, I hate that. When um, I start reading a question and then it just poof. <laughs> so let me pull it up here. Sorry about that. Okay. Need like a zillion different devices so that... Um, I'm looking for the Stephanie questions. Okay. Getting stuck at a level where the child could do song fill-ins and animal songs, can receptively identify a picture from array when given feature function class, student is very rote already, learns scripts, could start to teach labeling of feature function class. I'm sure he would memorize all of this. How do I avoid making him more rote and teaching flexibility? 
just acquired language for learning was planning to try that in the fall, but I'm worried I will create weird language. Yeah, you will. If you jump to language for learning, you certainly will create he won't be able to do it if he's only doing group one and two of the intraverbal assessment. So I think your first step is to complete one of these. Uh, second step is definitely to consider joining our online course and community where we have very systematic. Um, I am not actually a big fan on feature function class and doing all that tit for tat programming. I did a video blog about tit for tat programming um, a while back and I think it's it needs to be put in together and you also have to consider his problem behavior, his age, his self-care, his manding, all that stuff. I think a lot of people that are really gung-ho verbal behavior uh, actually end up making more of a mess of things because um, they're trying to teach and I did it. I made tons of mistakes when I was trying to teach Lucas uh, intraverbals and now I am much more likely to try to teach it flexibly, let as much come in naturally as possible and focus on the big rocks that are going to really move the needle. Okay. Danielle, who is a psychologist who's been in my online course and community for a long time said, I think when people teach to the test, uh, we get some big messy errors. For example, I had two, a kiddo, who could answer 25 who questions regarding community helpers, but could not tact any community helpers. Oh my goodness. Thoughts about fixing it. How far do I go back? Some kids meet the milestones, but have big gaps. Yeah, Danielle, I would say get the, get this done with them. Um, and you got to keep the tax. The tax are so much more important than any rote memorization of VV map. Um, so, we have within our online course an interverbal um, bonus video. I would follow that to a T because I have basically had a program for those basics, animal sounds, you eat this, you drink this, you sleep in a bed. Um, I would go back um, and I would stop having uh, children program, but programs uh, based on higher interverbals. Um, it really can make a mess of things. The, if you go to marybarbera.com forward slash workshop, um, and if you're a professional, if you know what feature function class is and you know what language for learning is, you can go click the box to watch the three mistakes, uh, professionals make with intermediate learners. And it's filled with all of the, uh, things that Danielle's talking about. Um, so yeah, totally go there. Okay. Um, Rosalie said, is the assessment only for younger children? My daughter is 15 with Down syndrome and autism. So Lucas um, is 23 and uh, he is probably in group five, six. Um, we don't assess him anymore with this kind of thing. We do teach him interverbal um intraverbals and tax as needed. We teach him new skills as needed. He's actually in language for learning now during the COVID shutdown. Um, so a lot of the skills we do teach, but, uh, we don't, you know, we don't do the BB map assessment. We don't sit down and do mixed BB with him. Um, so it's, it's not really chronologic age that we can stop doing any of this. It's more developmental language age. And I think it would be a really good idea if I had a 15 year old, uh, with down syndrome and autism, who was not conversational, I would definitely download this and get it done. Uh, all right. So Anna said, sorry, maybe I missed it, but would you test and teach introverbal with pictures available to the child? When you ask, where do you sleep? When do you sleep? Is it okay to have a picture of a bed night and other distractors like daytime and chair, or is it a true skill when the child responds to introverbal without visuals? Yeah. So by definition, introverbals are without visuals. Um, and that's, um, so we would assess without visuals. We could teach with visuals and do transfer procedures. Um, 
but uh anna you've been in my community for years and so i i know your son pretty well oh, i don't know him i've never actually met physically met you or your son but um but um you know the thing about introverbals is you have to teach functionally and so it's not just like i'm just going to keep beating this you know uh, trying to really force this because some kids like Lucas will get to a point where it's just not functional. Um, they have conditional discrimination errors between, uh, what do you cook on versus what do you cook with? And then in the end, is that really, does that really matter for Lucas and his life? And so I would just, um, caution you, uh, I am a big proponent of leaving visuals in and to teach comprehension um, and not worry about transferring it to uh, an introverbal and maybe letting the introverbals come up more naturally or doing simple introverbal webbing just for fun, which Lucas likes to do. So introverbal webbing, and you could do this actually with a group too, which is kind of cool. But I'll just say, okay, how we do it with an individual child, how we do it with Lucas is introverbal webbing is because he knows so many categories and because he likes categories, um, he will, uh, uh, will be out walking. Okay. What's that tree? Yeah. What color are the leaves? Green. What else is green? Frog. Tell me something else you eat. That's green. Broccoli. Good. Um, you know, do you like broccoli? Yes or no, you know, and those sorts of things. So we'll do like little webs on walks during, you know, just to review some information. And the nice thing about doing, and he knows his colors, he knows things that are red, yellow, green. I have a whole procedure within my online course about how to teach that stuff. But for him, that's kind of fun. Uh, even though group eight, what's inside a balloon, you know, he doesn't understand that and he's not going to, and it's not important to his, him or his life. So just really, uh, not teaching to the test, not being too concerned about mastering this. This is really just to eyeball. Hey, you know, if a child's having problem behaviors, especially, and, or the parent or the professional thinks the child is higher functioning than he actually is, Sometimes getting to the bottom of where they're at with introverbals will actually help kind of ground or get parents and professionals on the same page in terms of where the child is at. It's nobody's fault if he's not here and you thought he was all the way up there because if he's getting overly frustrated, like the little girl who was nine, who was flipping desks and had to be, you know, homeschooled because the mom was afraid, literally afraid that the police were going to be called. Um, she was getting so frustrated because the information was so much harder and she was trying to, um, get things right. And so making things easy, making things fun is always my, uh, what I would recommend. Um, so Sandy said my, uh, we recently discovered that while my son was working with the speech therapist, that he cannot imagine things that are not in the picture. For example, he identified a man in an armchair eating popcorn. The speech therapist asked, where is the person sitting? She offered choices, movies or at the park. And he responded park. Second thing she asked who takes care of the cow. There were four pictures, including a farmer and he couldn't answer who as it seems there were too many choices. Would you reduce the number of choices? Um, I actually, I, I think you're, the speech therapist are progr is programming too high for him in general. I would do this assessment and I would consider joining my online course. Um, there's just no other way around it. It is, you can't teach kids up here. It's like going into Spanish four when you're really still rocky with Spanish one and Spanish two class. Like you can't just keep plowing along just because they're eight or 12 or 15. You got to go like, okay, where's their language? Okay. Let me meet them back there and let me see if their mans are screwed up. Let me see if their tax are screwed up and let me see about these interverbals. Um, 
you can't just keep pushing a child because they will either have problem behavior or their their language will get so weird that it's not functional and it's not producing any quality interactions. Um, it can even be unsafe. You know, ch children um, and adults with autism tend to over answer yes, for instance. Um, that could actually be a very bad thing if a child doesn't understand questions and just over answers yes. They could be, uh, you know, I have a whole system on how to teach yes and no. I have a free video blog. But, you know, and I said this earlier for those of you that are just joining, I've been doing Facebook Live since February, every Monday at one o'clock. Um, but I'm going to stop actually for a while because it, there, I'm producing so much free content and people are just swimming in this sea of free content. I'm telling you, this is, it is ridiculously complex. It is not easy. You need step-by-step -step guidance and you need to invest in learning and invest both time and money in terms of learning exactly what to do. And I think it's kind of a disservice if I keep coming on and answering little questions here or there because um, time is of the essence. Whether you have a two-year-old with just signs of autism or if you have a 15-year-old, time is still of the essence. We have to get them as safe as possible, as independent as possible, and as happy as possible. Um, and focusing so much on intraverbals can sometimes be an issue. Danielle's agreeing with me. Um, can a speech therapist complete the intraverbal assessment or only a BCBA? Actually, this intraverbal assessment is free. Parents can complete it. You know, how I would complete it is I would sit down with a child and I would, I would just say, a kitty says, or if he doesn't understand kitty, I would say a cat says, if you're speaking a different language, whatever, however you say it, it's a fill in the blank. I would sing a song, twinkle, twinkle, little, Let's see what they say. Um, now I wouldn't say twinkle, twinkle, little star, twinkle, twinkle, little, you know, uh, I may do that just to get them going and then test it the next day. Um, but you need to learn how to teach this stuff. You need to know how to assess it. Assessing is actually pretty easy. Uh, especially the first couple of groups. Now, don't keep going with the groups. If they don't get, you know, half of them right, don't even move on to the next group. Um, they will like basically sealing out. Um, it's very common for kids to have, say, you know, 30% in group one and 20% in group two. Uh, a couple of my clients started out with ready, set, go as their only interverbal. Um, so that, then, you know, they're functioning basically at an 18 month old typical development and at least in terms of intraverbals, which intraverbals are not the most important operant. The most important operant again is the MAND, M-A-N-D. Um, that is a request. And if a child can't MAND for what they want, they will most likely have severe problem behaviors. Claudia said my... Boy is 22 months old and the only words he verbalizes are diamond and up. Well, two words is certainly better than zero. He understands so many words, colors, shapes, clothes, body parts. He communicates by pointing when he wants something. I don't think we have a problem with eye contact. I give him a choice. Um, uh, and he's expressing by pointing what he wants, but that's where we are. I'm very concerned. And Claudia, you should be very concerned and there is a ton you can do. I would urge you to sign up for the free workshop and consider joining the toddler preschooler course. It would be perfect for you. We do not heavily focus on colors and shapes. Um, but if your son likes that stuff, I show you how to incorporate that. But, uh, you know, several of the participants in there are seeing so much transformation. So, um, I would urge you to consider it. Uh, okay, yes, the information is very helpful and yes, time is of the essence and is more complex than it seems from a professional perspective, yeah. And because I'm both, I'm a, a mom 
and I'm a behavior analyst and I'm a registered nurse and an author. I have spoken all around the world on autism. Um, I can assure you my program is as step-by-step -step as they come. I understand your role, whether you're a parent or professional, I understand both roles and it's so critical to get each child to reach his or her fullest potential. So if I didn't get to your question today, I'm sorry, but hopefully uh, by attending a free workshop, you'll learn more about what I can provide you. If you ever have a, a struggle in the autism world, you can always Google Mary Autism plus whatever your struggle is. I have free guides on potty and sleep and toddler tantrums versus autism or ADHD. We have got a wealth of information out there. So, and I'm not saying I'm never coming back live. I'm just going to take a break uh, for a while as I finish my second book. It's coming out April of 2021. I encourage you to join our online course and community. That's really where I can help you best um, or take advantage of the free uh, information I have there. I do appreciate your time today and joining us, asking such great questions and listening to my little talk on interverbal um, assessment. So have a great week. Um, and I will see you soon.